As the world mourns uh, the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu, we take a look at the legacy of the anti-apartheid icon. And former President Olusha Obasanjo denies claims that he hates the people of the Niger Delta. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anako. World leaders mourn South Africa's anti-apartheid hero and Nobel Peace Laureate, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who died yesterday at the age of 90. Uh, President Buhari said his death had further created a void in the world in dire need of wisdom, integrity, courage and sound reasoning. He recalled uh, the historic role that Archbishop Tutu played in the fight against minority rule, enduring physical assaults, jail terms and prolonged exile. Well, joining us to discuss this is Foreign Affairs Editor Agogo Obo and, of course, International Relations Analyst Michael Nketia. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you for the time and opportunity. Great. All right, Agogo, I'm going to start with you. Um, it's, it's interesting that world leaders are pouring encomiums on, you know, the late um, Archbishop um, but of course, I mean, m most of us who've read, most of us who've heard, most of us who know about the uh, late Archbishop, uh, we know him for his tenacity, the man who stood side by side with the former um, um, South African president, the late Nelson Mandela. Uh, there's so many encomiums coming his way, but then we're looking at the legacy of the man. So let's start with the fact that this man held a Nobel Peace Prize in 1984. I was just telling somebody, I was just a year old when this man got that Nobel Peace Laureate. Um, and what are the, the major legacies, aside from being a peace, um, you know, um, uh, let's call him a, a peace fellow for South Africa. What are the other things that people can point to uh, when we are talking about the late Archbishop? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's massive. The fact that that's point two two, popularly called the Arch, died at the age of 90, and yet people still say they miss him, makes you realize just how fantastic he was as a, as a figure, not just in South Africa, but in the entire African continent. And there are many reasons why he was massive, the chief of them being the fact that um, he did fight side by side with the ANC. In, uh, in making sure that uh, uh, the evil apartheid rule and policy <laughs> exactly what and uh, this was major major reasons. In fact, you know, even though he was a cleric, he was known more for his activism. And uh, I remember vividly when Nelson Mandela was free, uh, he stood side by side with him. And interestingly, they both live on the Villakazi, popular Villakazi Street there. They uh, grew up on one of the more popular streets in South Africa, where uh, Nelson Mandela and, uh, uh, and uh, Nelson Mandela and uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu did uh, stay. So it's massive, and you're right. If you would call two popular, most popular Africans, one would be Nelson Mandela, and the two would be. Uh, Desmond Tutu, no small wonder that uh, throughout Mandela's time, even after he was out of jail, uh, Desmond Tutu and, and Nelson Mandela did stick closely. Uh, even after Mandela was president, uh, ended his tenure as president of uh, Free South Africa, uh, they still worked together in the elders group, which was a group which uh, came together to find ways in which they could bring about global peace. And interestingly, he had, uh, recommended that Mandela join uh, the elders then because. It was his thinking that if Mandela invited anyone, uh, the person had to have a good reason for not going to, not being able to attend that. So, big, big, big uh, feeling. And, and the fact that uh, um, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, uh, before the end, of, you know, the fight to end apartheid, he, he, he went to jail several times. He wasn't just speaking behind the pulpit, calling for an end uh, to the injustice against his people. He did, he'd also you know, led, by the, led from the front in the protests that happened. And he was a key figure in all of those uh, major events that happened uh, in the 60s and 70s, leading up to uh, Nelson Mandela's release 
Even the transition period is one of the bloodiest pre periods in South African history. The brief period uh, just after uh, Mandela was released from prison and uh, marching towards uh, the elections. He, he, did also, he also did mention uh, uh, take a, a huge role. And um, uh, Archbishop Beston Tutu's role grew because with the elders, he got involved in many things in the African uh, continent. I remember the, the Darfur crisis was also a leading voice there. I remember in Cote d'Ivoire when I was there in 2012. Uh, 2011, uh, Laurent Gbagbo and, uh, and uh, Alassane Ouattara over the election yes. uh, Wahala. He was he also came in. So, I mean, he was everywhere. He, he had his footprints in every, in every part of the country. And, and finally, of the continent. And finally, um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission it was a privilege and an honor to see him lead that because he was just the best fit, the, the best fit for such a role in ensuring that um, all of the injustices. If they had the opportunity to say anything, it would have come through uh, Desmond Tutu chairing the Twitter Reconciliation Commission hmm. in South Africa. Interesting. Let me come to you, Michael. Um, looking at the time where the, the South Africans found themselves, the apartheid uh, regime, um, many people would say that it was not an easy fit to want to put yourself in the shoes of the archbishop at the time but he did stand his ground and many actually did say that if at the point the uh, anc um sometime in the future lost its footing uh, he did not hide under any guys he spoke truth to power now looking at our world today and the kind of person that archbishop desmond tutu was is it easy to say that we can find those kinds of people in and around Africa, in the continent, um, you know, speaking truth to power, as opposed to what we saw in that day and age? Well, it is quite um, a big shoes to be filled by any other politician on the African continent. But to, be, to face reality with you, I would say that the success of Nelson Mandela as president of South Africa, having presided over a united and peaceful country following the dangerous and troubled times of apartheid, much of the credit should be given to the revered Archbishop Desmond Tutu. The only difference between Zimbabwe after independence and South Africa after independence was that there was a Desmond Tutu who saw to it that regardless of the atrocities that the African community suffered in the hands of the white oppressors, there was still the need for them to live together in the same jurisdiction. And if you remember when Desmond Tutu was made as chairperson of the South African Reconciliation Committee, that was charged or tasked by Nelson Mandela to prepare the grounds for a new united country made up of various people from various racial backgrounds. There was so much agitation. There was so there was this clarion call for people who abused and violated the rights of people during the apartheid regime and by so doing and making specific reference to the white oppressors to be punished, to be, to, to be made to face the law. But people like Desmond Tutu saw beyond his time and preached for forgiveness. This is a man who embraced forgiveness, preached forgiveness to an entire nation, and eventually the nation accepted his form of, 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 of living together, peaceful coexistence. Mm -hmm. Although today there are still some people in South Africa who believe that those who are responsible for the apartheid regime should have been made to face the law, and still people criticize Desmond Tutu, who was chair of the reconciliation for his failure to recommend very punitive measures against the white oppressors. But we all know that his decision to go against the popular will of the people then and rather advocate for peaceful coexistence has been the foundation of modern day South Africa. So the man has a lot to offer. And it's quite strange that having such an icon across the continent in Africa, politics has been winner takes all. When people win power, they want to use the power to intimidate, attack their opponents, suppress their opponents. And it's happening all around us. In Uganda, mm -hmm. we have Yuweri Museveni, who has been a tyrant, arresting almost everybody in the opposition. You go to Zimbabwe, even after the death of Robert Mugabe and the atrocities that were, that were unleashed against Morgan Changarai, 
even after Mugabe's death, the new president is pursuing the same path, mm. go to Rwanda. Evi evidently, we've seen some form of socio-economic development, significant ones, that there is virtually no opposition in Rwanda. The country's parliament is rubber stamped, and the country is ruled at the wishes and command of a single individual, Paul Kagame. It is replicated across the continent. Go to Togo, virtually no opposition. Alassane Ouattara comes to power on the backdrop of a civil war that was triggered by the refusal of his successor, Laurent Babo, to leave power. And after he inherits the throne, he does the very same thing that, that plunged his country into a civil war. So these are the kind of leaders we have today. And it's quite unfortunate. So does, this, does, this, not make, does this not make us wonder if these leaders have not taken um, any leaf or borrowed leaf from what South Africa went through. Uh, does this not also mean that our African leaders are not necessarily or have not necessarily learned anything from the life of the, the Archbishop, uh, even in his passing? Because, I mean, I'm, I, we could add more and more names. Agogo and I can just continue to reel out the names of African leaders who may not necessarily um, be leading their countries aright. So I'm asking... Does this not mean that maybe our, our leaders and maybe even the people who are their followers are not necessarily interested in, you know, pivoting some form of change uh, for the continent or direct, redirecting the continent? I believe that the ordinary people on the continent, especially the continent's unemployed youth, Africa has a more youthful population than any continent on, on, on planet Earth. And majority of these youth are unemployed. And if people have to embark on such dangerous journeys on the, on the, on the, on the, on the sea in an attempt to reach Italy and other parts of Europe, then these people definitely are concerned, are worried, and are demanding and clamoring for some form of change and socioeconomic development on the continent. But the big question is, are the leaders in charge? Those at the helm of affairs, those with power, are they as interested in the change as the very followers or as the people that they are leading. For that, I would say no. Some leaders on the continent, few of them, I have to be specific, have shown tendencies of leading uh, grassroots or wide socioeconomic changes that, 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 has, that we've witnessed some form of socioeconomic development in the lives of people. But with the exception of those few people who go to Mauritius, they are doing so well. You go to Botswana, they are doing so well. Rwanda is doing so well socioeconomically. Ghana has been the star with regards to democratic credentials and socioeconomic development since a return to multi party democracy in 1992. However, same cannot be said of other leaders on the continent. Mm. Nigeria should be the shining star of Africa. Majority of its youth are unemployed. And the very medium where these youth used to express dissent, to, to express their worry and frustration, Twitter, social media, has been okay. banned for more than a year, even by the current president. I mean, that's a whole kettle of fish on its own. We, we can go on and about. on and on about that. But let me quickly go back to Agogo. Agogo, I, I want to believe that Desmond Tutu must have done something to religious leaders also uh, across the continent because we see that this man was not just... Uh, talking from the pulpit, he also went to the streets to do the same thing he was asking people to do. Now, let's bring it home to Nigeria. We've seen um, a former vice presidential aspirant, um, Tunde Bakari, speaking a lot lately. We've seen the, the likes of the, um, the senior pastor of the House on the Rock Church, Paula De Farassin, speaking a lot. We also see a reverend father. Um, um, what's his name now? The, the reverend, the priest from um, Kaduna State, if I'm not mistaken, or Plateau State. I, I can't get his name right now. But we've seen those kinds of people speaking up. But can we say that religious leaders are taking that stand to not just preach about what's in the good book. And when I say religious leaders, I'm not just talking about the Christian dumb. I'm talking about religious leaders across board. Can we see these religious leaders also coming into the forefront of pushing for some sort of change and asking for good leadership and governance on the continent? Let's start with Nigeria as a case study. Yeah, brilliant. Um, when, when you think about what Desmond Tutu did with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a lot of people expected that it would be like the Nuremberg 
uh, sort of trial where you had uh, those who were responsible for the program and things that happened during the Second World War faced lengthy jail times. Some of them were killed. Um, if you go back to uh, Hitler's uh, Nazi Germany and the rest of that. But unfortunately, what you had with the Twitter Reconciliation Commission did not give them the powers uh, to convict people. It was just more of a way people should come out and say, uh, this is what happened. And in fact, people who were going to be accused, who were, who were the so-called uh, oppressors and those who victimized the people, that signed a deal where, say, if they said, we did X, Y, and Z in return, uh, for uh, admitting to the guilt and saying we're sorry, they were going to be um, expropriated, expropriated from any crime and charge. So, of course, there's a lot of criticism around that. Interestingly, I spoke with um, uh, Bishop Matthew Hassan Puka, who is the Bishop, Bishop Puka. I was trying to remember his name. Yes. Yeah, who is a, who is a, who is the Catholic uh, Bishop of uh, Sokoto Diocese a couple of days ago on his impressions of. Um, uh, Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu. And he'd been in South Africa too because you know Nigeria has had a horrific military rule where a lot of people have suffered injustice. Just one uh, local government, the River State, which was the, uh, the Ogoni people in the aftermath of Kensaro Weaver's uh, you know, trial and his execution, had yes. 10,000 petitions. I mean, I mean, they had several thousand petitions. And he said he'd gone to South Africa, he'd met uh, Desmond Tutu. I mean, through Kyle Fire, who at that, during that time, the governor of the state, who, who was an activist then, um, get, got the report of the Twitter Reconciliation Commission and then suddenly realized, too, same with the frustration Desmond Tutu had uh, with the fact that many of those guys who were responsible for the injustice that happened during the apartheid uh, were not going to be convicted. The same thing happened with us. The people who were responsible for the atrocities, the gross violation of rights, the killings during the military era in Nigeria. Uh, never appeared. In fact, some of them did not even appear before the, before the tribunal. I think it was only Olusha Gunabasanja because he was incumbent president then mm -hmm. that he appeared before the tribunal. Um, 20 years down the line, look at what has happened, whether the rights in Nigeria put in, in any sort of way. Uh, uh, Kuka, uh, Bishop Kuka says, yeah, I mean, being a moral compass, what, what sort of what he does by criticizing governments, interesting the same governments that have worked. I mean, I'm with him uh, criticizing uh, military rule and the transition to democratic uh, rule in Nigeria. Many of them now point fingers back at him, saying, "Why are you criticizing us uh, when this is happening?" So yes, there's the legacy. People look at, people try to replicate what happened with the reconciliation commission in uh, in Nigeria, for example. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the Uputa panel, the, the, paper, the report was never uh, was never followed through. Many of the people who were found guilty for things, who were indicted for many of the crimes that happened, never went or found themselves. In Court because somebody went to court and then they, they, could, they could put a, a seal on it and nothing could happen afterwards. Mm. Or other countries like Rwanda did try out their own system, they called it Gachacha, and they did take a number of cases. I remember Gachacha was a local system where people could come out and then uh, talk with the oppressors and say, This person did this against me. And the local system found punishment uh, for mm. this before. Juries out whether that was successful or not. But um, I, I think that at the heart of this, which is what Desmond Tito talks about, is the social justice component. Mm -hmm. If people still feel or wrong, uh, feel injustice about how they were treated, they still feel that the social and economic rights are still being abused, it's always going to be difficult for you to win them over. Um, no, matter, no matter how hard we try and seeking for reforms democratically, once that isn't dealt with, you must keep finding the ways people will try to find, uh, mm -hmm. rather find ways to express themselves and uh, uh, seek other means of Getting their uh, getting their their rights uh, ob uh, their rights uh, obeyed. Uh, unfortunately, I hear people talk about military rule, which is simply unconscionable that we can talk of return of military rule when we think about the atrocities that happened during the military era, compared to where we are as, 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 as democratic nations in the African continent. Hmm. It's a place we shouldn't be thinking of. Well, back, back to Michael, I'm just going to piggyback on what um, um, Agogo has said, that uh, the people have to be allowed to express their feelings. The people have to be, be able to get some form of dividends of democracy or governance. Let's go back to what you said, Michael. Um, you talked about, you mentioned briefly the Twitter ban in Nigeria. And of course, you do remember, because you and I have spoken uh, about the, what happened on October 20, 2020. 
of course, the average Nigerian now does not necessarily think about protesting anymore because, of course, we are, are still traumatized um, by what happened. And if you've been following the stories, you also know that um, it's been rubbish. And um, it's a, I think it's a few days before the end of the year. We still haven't heard anything. It doesn't look like uh, anywhere on the radar that the government is going to do anything about it and the blood that was shared because they, it seems like they're trying to rubbish it. So how do people, and this is not just in Nigeria, this is detail for everything. We saw what happened uh, during the elections in Uganda. We saw what Bobby Wine had to go through, how his wife and his family was treated. We're seeing this in many parts of Africa. If Africans feel like there's a, a, a plaster or a tape over the, their mouth and they're unable to speak or that their hands are being tied behind their backs, how do we get good governance in the first instance? And secondly, we're asking that the, the West does not paint a picture of us that makes us look like a dark continent. But are we also not helping to paint the continent black, especially our leaders? That is an interesting assertion, you see. The problem we currently have in Africa is that we have a very youthful population who wants more, who want to see things happening in Africa as witness in other parts of the world. And these young people are being led by very old people who are out of touch with reality, basically above or beyond the age threshold of this youthful population. So the kind of people leading Africa have no idea what governance is in the 21st century, what science, technology, social innovations are in the 21st century. And the kind of people being ruled, majority of whom, who of course are the youth, also want to see happening on the continent what is happening elsewhere in North America, in Europe, even in other parts of Asia and Latin America. So number one, much talk has been about the Western media painting a very dark picture of the continent. Of course, there are some Africans in Libya, in South Africa, in Ghana, in Botswana, Mauritius, they are living better lives than people in some parts of Europe, in some parts of Southeast Asia, Latin America, even in some parts of North America and Central America. Why is this picture not being shown to the whole world rather than images of war-torn countries in Africa? But who are the very people responsible for these images? To the best of my knowledge, when innocent young protesters were shot at at the Lekki Toll Gate, it wasn't the Western media who fired those weapons. It was the Nigerian army and police under the, acting under the command of the Nigerian government or who so ever that was in charge. When people who were demonstrating for electoral reforms in Togo in the lead up to the country's presidential elections were shot, were killed, some were arrested arbitrarily without any form of trial and are still in detention. All these atrocities were unleashed against the African people by their own leaders. So one way or the other, we are the very people painting our continent black to the rest, to the black to the rest of the world. When two brothers or family members decide to fight, outsiders may only observe and report to others just as they saw it. And it becomes quite unfortunate when they even report beyond what they saw. And that is the reality that we are having now. Okay. Now, can the very people who are advocating for change, should they give up? Because these same dictators, despots, heavy-handed, old, out-of-touch leaders are in charge. No, we shouldn't give up. Nigeria has a very youthful population. Ghana has a very youthful population. If you look at the three dominant economies on the continent, and by that, I'm talking about Nigeria, I'm talking about South Africa, and I'm talking about Egypt. The populations of these countries is predominantly youthful. Mm. And these are the three countries which should be leading Africa's socioeconomic transformation. We saw just how America's influence in North America transformed the whole of North America and even Western Europe after the First and Second World War when they introduced the Marshall Plan to basically reconstruct, refinance Europe that had been ravaged by war. Okay. So Nigeria for the Sub-Saharan Africa, Nigeria and South Africa, and Egypt for North Africa, I believe that the youth and people in these countries, despite the vivid expression of, uh, of, uh, of dictatorship around them, 
the youth should continue fighting for more. All they right. shouldn't give up. They should keep fighting, and we'll get the type of governance and results that we want to see. Thank you continue. very much. Unfortunately, time is not our friend, but I want to say thank you to Foreign Affairs Editor Agogo Obo and International Relations Analyst Michael Nketia. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for having us. All right. Thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. When we return, former President Olusegun Obasanjo denies claims that he hates the people of the Niger Delta. Stay with us. We'll be right back.